Good evening, everyone. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, hello, my name is Simon Morris, the Director of Research in the School of Art, Architecture and Design at Leeds Beckett University. Firstly, thank you all for coming, and thank you to the Landscape Institute for sponsoring tonight's event with a fabulous drinks reception. I can see you've enjoyed it from all the glasses. Tonight, we welcome Jana Crepon, world-renowned Dutch landscape architect, and in a minute, my colleague, Principal Lecturer Edward Knighton will introduce our honoured guest. Jana Crepon is a senior partner in the Dutch practice Inside Outside, and that couldn't be more perfect, as she is speaking at our prestigious Inside Out lecture series. Almost a seamless match of names. The mission of the prestigious Inside Out lecture series is to bring the best minds of our generation to inspire the work students and staff do across the school. In order to enhance the cultural life of Leeds, we make the lecture series open to the general public and available to an international audience online. We hope you enjoy tonight's lecture. Edwin, please come and introduce our honoured guest, formerly Jana Kreppel. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Simon. There's a couple of housekeeping things I just want to uh, say before I do my introduction. Um, after my introduction, uh, Jano will be talking and then there'll be some opportunity for questions and we need to be running around with the microphone, I understand, to do that, so uh, we'll explain that when we get to it. After that, the Landscape Institute have an uh, annual general meeting and they don't want anyone to leave the room um, if you're part of the Yorkshire and Humberside branch of the Landscape Institute because the AGM will be held in here. I'm told it will be a short meeting of about half an hour. Less than half an hour. Okay. So that'd be great if the uh, landscape architects can stay on after that. Okay, so um, I'm thrilled to welcome uh, Jana uh, from uh, Amsterdam. Um, it's a, a design-based practice, and I was really keen uh, when thinking about uh, inviting a, a practitioner to come and talk today, that it's a practice that's not just about landscape architecture. Um, landscape architecture is an eclectic sort of um, uh, discipline and covers a number of bases. But when I saw what uh, the practice that Inside Outside do, I think it's really interesting and intriguing as, a, as an artist and designer. And I think uh, seeing the so-called boundaries that we make for different disciplines in a place like this, it makes you question about how we approach design. And I think you know, when you look at the books and the practices that they've done, um, I think it makes a, hopefully for a, a really interesting evening, I hope, in a few minutes. Um, it's part of our 50 years um, celebration of landscape architecture at Leeds and uh, we started off in October with um, the Jellicoe Lecture um, with the Landscape Institute and we've had a number of smaller events through the year uh, with uh, practitioners and we're finishing off sort of tonight with a keynote uh, lecture from, uh, from Jana Crepon in a few minutes. Of course we've got our end of year um, uh, exhibition on the 2nd of June coming up. So I hope all of you can make it to that as well, which is, uh, is the end of our uh, academic year. Um, the, the, the practice that Jana works for, you know, their innovative and collaborative design process has created many stunning designs around the world. Um, its scope is really intriguing and interesting. It's from fabrics and interiors to structures and to landscapes. And the idea is that it will reach out to students and practitioners uh, beyond their own professional interests. Um, in the 50 years that we've been running uh, landscape architecture here at Leeds, um, we must have had over 1,000 graduates. And I'd really like to welcome the alumni back uh, to Leeds. And I know there's quite a few in the room tonight, and it's great to see you here. Um, quite a lot of uh, the Leeds graduates are local practitioners. And it's really great to see them coming back to the university and we'd like to welcome them back um, to come and talk to us uh, in future years, uh, uh, telling us about what they do. And um, so just contact any of the lecturers here if you're up for doing that next year. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that helps to make us distinctive at Leeds is our, um, our base from the Leeds Polytechnic all those years ago, which is what it was when I first joined it. And I think the hand-in-glove approach to uh, design and practice is really important. So 
the seamless uh, transition, if you like, between what we do in the academic world with the real world out there is really important to what we do. And I think the values of the polytechnics uh, are something which are, is really something which uh, is still very pertinent today. So that idea that our students are people who can do things is, is really important. The other um, thing I'd like to just say a few things about is our art school heritage. And the Polytechnic was made up of several institutions, one of which was an art school. And I think the art schools are, are, are fantastic places where we develop the individual. And it's creative and non-formulaic. It's, and in our case, it's providing well-grounded innovators who can apply their artistry in a range of ways. Um, our students, I think, by and large, are passionate people and are really turned on by design. And they have this can-do attitude. I think it's also about a journey rather than the destination. And by that, I mean it's about a process that we go through, if you like, a path. And I think when we're 18 or 19-year-olds, that path is not always that clear to us. And it's really nice, I think, today to see that we've got people from fine art and product design and planners and people like that here uh, with us and hopefully we can convert them into landscape architects at some point. Um, when I was reading what Simon was putting in his draft for the end of your show uh, catalogue, he's uh, quoted Michael Craig Martin, who I know a little bit about, and um, he had a quote from him about, um, I would never advise anyone to be an artist. And I'd like to add to that, but not, a not an artist, but you could be a landscape architect. <laughs> so I think... Yeah, anyone who thinks they're an artist, they might want to apply it through landscape architecture. And hopefully we'll see some examples of that in a few minutes, because I'm sure what Jana will be talking about will um, open people's eyes to what landscape architecture is and for what you think it could be as well. So, uh, just moving on a little bit, um, I'd like to welcome the students from outside landscape architecture. So you just, just wave to me if you're... Yeah, I know we've got some fine artists over there, so we've got a few people and some product designers. Yeah, so it's great to see you here today. So we'll be not letting you out of the room until you sign up for a course in a few minutes. Um, hopefully you've seen the exhibition that we've got in the A building across the road in uh, Broadcasting Place, which shows some of the work by the, some of the people in the room here today. Um, there's about 50-odd panels of work by uh, our alumni. And, um, yeah, we've got a great heritage here at Leeds. Uh, from people who've worked on uh, you know, world-renowned projects like the Eden Project in Cornwall, or setting up practices like LDA Design, uh, who worked on the Olympic uh, Village with George Hargreaves, the American landscape architect. But more importantly, I think, are the small practices uh, which, which change and transform uh, people's everyday environments. So through little gestures, we can do big things. And I think that's really uh, significant for what we do as designers. Um, yeah, so have a look at that fascinating kaleidoscope of what we do as landscape architects, if you can, please. The exhibition will be up until, hopefully, the end of this academic year. Finally, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Simon for his support, uh, Simon Morris, uh, for supporting this uh, lecture. It's the last in the series. Um, it's our landscape architecture lecture. We've had them from the other professional areas as well. And um, hopefully, it's the last and the best um, the Landscape Institute, uh, the Yorkshire branch, um, have been a great support uh, for the course. And we've got Mark um, here, who's the... Uh, what's your title, Mark? Are you the chairman of the, of the Yorkshire branch? And we'd like to thank the uh, branch for their support uh, for the course. Um, Mark's an ex-student here, and we really like that connection continuing. Um, and, of course, as has already been noted... The Prosecco and the quality of the catering is vastly superior to what we're used to in the university. <laughs> okay. Um, and just on a personal note, I'd just like to say you know, thank you to my colleagues and the students uh, for uh, you know, creating such a stimulating and uh, privileged place to work um, um, for the last, in my case, 20, 29 years. So with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Jana, who's going to tell us hopefully some really interesting insights into how your practice works. Okay, thank you. Hopefully no pressure there. Can you hear me well? Okay, so first of all, uh, welcome everyone. 
Uh, I feel very much honored to be here in Leeds, uh, to be invited for your alumni lecture series. Um, one second, first concentrating on the real thing. Um, so I've had in enough introduction, I guess, uh, so I just go right ahead, uh, just saying that I'm very, very much pleased to be here and also to meet some of you, uh, speak to you, see the environment where the students uh, are working on projects, uh, meeting people that inspire them, and also to see that it's such a broad uh, education, that it's not just focused in you know one little uh, box, but uh, it seems very uh, cross-disciplinary, um, which is what we like very much. Just to introduce um, our practice a little bit more, uh, as already told, uh, we are a practice in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, as our name hints, uh, we are doing interior environments as well as landscapes, uh, so inside and outside. Uh, we work very often very much connected to architects, uh, really as a team, like we start uh, with analysis together and we finish off in construction site, uh, but we also have uh, autonomous projects where we really create our, our projects uh, mainly uh, focused on landscape or interiors. Um, our office is well known for the in interaction between uh, the different um, fields, but also the literal uh, connection between inside and outside. Uh, so I will take you through a few of our projects First, let me introduce our, our team uh, in a typical Amsterdam environment. Uh, and as you see, uh, there's uh, all sorts of different people in our team. Actually, they have different educations even more. There's um, um, uh, people who designed uh, uh, fashion, people who designed costumes, uh, anthropologists by origin. And we all transformed into a certain uh, specific uh, profession but still we are all working together on all these projects. Uh, the office was uh, started um, by Petra Bläser, uh, who's an artist and really through work actually discovered the whole field of uh, working in all these different disciplines. And uh, at this moment, uh, this is sort of uh, overview of our landscape projects uh, until now and where we are working on the globe. And that also shows you a certain issue that we have in our work. We work in different climates. This is a cl map of uh, the, the different cond growing conditions uh, on the planet. <coughs> and you see that uh, we work in so many different environments, so every time we actually have to adjust again. So we are never experts. We are always beginners somehow in our work. Uh, I would like to take you through some of our projects and uh, describe our tools, basically. Uh, because I gave this lecture a name, Trajectories, that's one of our tools. But there are many more, uh, m many more tools, of course, in our work. And I would like to show you just a few and also show how things are going in and out all the time. By the way, this is our studio. But then um, th also the tools, they are never just applied either for the interior or for the exterior project. But you have filters that can be curtains or that can be trees. Um, you know, almost plant-like curtains that we design, uh, curtains that perforate, uh, that are perforated to uh, introduce little spots of light in a darkened room, uh, that sort of create new rooms within architecture. That's actually something that we call the autonomy of the curtain. Um, the curtains can have very functional uh, programs, uh, acoustic um, regulating of, of environments, uh, light filtering, uh, but they can also translate uh, certain uh, pictures and images and mythologies uh, into our projects. Uh, these are all light filtering tools, but then of course the outside inside tool is something that we do very much in this uh, cooperation with the architects. From the very beginning, because we are involved from the very beginning, we can really uh, look with the architects how we can integrate uh, out outdoor spaces into the ex interior of the architecture. <coughs> we work very mu often together with um, architects from the beginning, and well, that this was actually for this one. Uh, and one of the offices that we work very much very often is uh, OMA, the Office of Ram Kohlhaas, 
But in the meantime, we also developed a broad um, collaboration with many other architects. Um, so the inside out or the outside in, uh, like in this project in the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, or in a private house, or uh, reflections is another tool. Um, they can be, you know, vertical, horizontal. They can create depth into a field. They can show you the garden behind at the same time that you see it in front of you. They can enlarge spaces and can en double the green. And they play with our curtains on the inside. Another tool that uh, is used very often in our work is a framed view, like the sneaky peek in this exhibition uh, for, um, for nude art uh, in, in Germany. Um, or a tiny hint of the outside spaces in this gallery exhibition, or in Casa de Musica in Porto. Or like in this exhibition, which was um, called the Snapshots, uh, where the exhibition actually explored how photography was used in the very beginning uh, to influence paintings, and how, how painters used actually photography for their art. Uh, we did the installation for this exhibition and also worked a lot with um, the effect of light coming from the outside of the building into the inside and creating this filmic uh, mm. quality. There's perforations and oddly shaped uh, openings uh, everywhere in our work. Uh, another important issue that I just addressed briefly with this map that I showed you in the beginning is that we always have to influence the micro microclimate, almost always. There's hardly ever the perfect climate. I'm not sure if that exists. Uh, so there's always sun to screen or to filter. There's always water to catch and to capture and to hold and plants to protect from the wind. Uh, there's shade uh, to provide for people. Or Sometimes we also try to create new microclimates with shading installations in, a, in, a, in an arid climate, which could uh, potentially create a totally new environment. But we also uh, always search for the local treasures. It's actually something that is funny enough that we are such a global office that we really work in many different places, but never work global in that sense. We always try to work local. We always work with local people like on our first meetings, we establish the context with local people. We try to find what is, you know, the local treasure. Try to find the most beautiful places, the typical places, the ugliest places, and see how we can work with that. And so we also created this um, uh, garden in Qatar, uh, which is only made of native plants. And when we started with that project, people actually laughed at us and said, like, we don't have plants, we are a desert state, we only have desert. But then we said, like, but what about this? Oh, that's a weed that grows next to the highway. We said, yeah, that's what we are talking about. Let's make a garden out of it. And this is the result of it, uh, almost scientific garden, you could say, very systematic, which has a gradient of uh, water uh, applied to the garden uh, from very limited or actually no additional water uh, to more and more water, so that actually the, the local plants can really um, show, show off their beauty in a way. So they get better and better conditions, and they can show off their beauty to the people who actually don't really know that it's their native plants. So it's also a sort of educational process. So and here I come to the, to the main theme of my lecture, the trajectories. Uh, trajectories not as in the bullet that uh, flies through space, but as a sort of deliberate a course that someone takes, or a, a development, uh, a, a path of development and evolving. Uh, because in every project, uh, we, we try to add something additional to the project. That's a funny picture to start with. It's a prison garden uh, from a very long time ago. But you will recognize that uh, the, the shapes of the path in landscape and the shape of the paths of our curtains are sometimes also a family, because our curtains are not just a straight line in front of the window, but they are autonomous in space. 
and uh, the tracks actually are the paths of the curtains and they are the trajectories that the curtains can take in the space. So in our installation in the architectural ben biennial in Venice a few years ago, uh, we were able to uh, do an installation in the Dutch pavilion where with one object, one continuous curtain, with a very crazy track, we actually created many different rooms. Uh, and so that uh, trajectory is as much present inside as outside in many different shapes. Uh, I would like to focus on trajectories for my lectures. So I'm not <coughs> telling you all about our work, but I really will focus on one theme, the trajectories, and how we create different routes, how we create different experiences by laying out uh, a project in a, in a certain way. I will start with a very old project, uh, the Seattle Library, a uh, collaboration with OMA Architects, uh, a public library building in uh, Seattle. Uh, where inside, outside, and at that time mainly Petra Bläser, uh, created uh, the gardens around uh, the library and allowed these gardens to enter the building. So this is a building or a picture of the process, you know, where you really see the, the intense uh, collaboration of the team. Um, and the idea was that uh, these carpets, uh, which are actually the, the gardens outside the buildings, uh, would enter the building and create a trajectory, an informal trajectory of places throughout the building, ending up at the top in a roof garden. So throughout the buildings, uh, you have um, uh, places uh, that invite people to sit down, to meet, to read a book, uh, that define spaces within the bigger, bigger whole. So these gardens around the building, they, um, they are the starting point. They are uh, consisting of native uh, species from the region and they enter the building in form of uh, carpets that are actually pictures of those species, pictures that Petra took uh, in the nature in, in Seattle and that were applied in, an, in a sort of artistic way throughout the building. What is interesting about uh, the scale of the carpets is that it actually minimizes the massiveness of these uh, huge bookshelves, of huge tables and allows people actually to, to float around also. And a very different trajectory is the direct connection uh, in, um, in one of our more recent projects. It started in 2003, but it's still ongoing and at this moment under construction. Uh, a new park in uh, the center of Milan. And this, the strategy of this uh, park was very much inspired by the desire lines that people create in fields, you know, the straight lines when you just want to go from A to B. And the story of that is that um, the site of, the, of this new park, which is a completely new park of 10 hectare uh, in the center of Milan, used to be an industrial site that really was isolating all the areas around it. It really separated the city from each other. So it was a huge uh, track for, or a huge site for train tracks and industry which was inaccessible and split uh, the city. So the urge was to connect and to connect straight and direct and very obvious. So connection was really one of the most uh, yeah, imminent uh, issues uh, for this park. So the strategy uh, of this park is actually consisting of three layers of the straight lines that really connect uh, one area with the other, of the irregular fields that are created as a sort of residue of these paths, and a layer of circular forests that hoover over this uh, city. And what was very interesting for us to see is that throughout uh, the process, so the, the project was, or the competition was won in 2004, um, you have to imagine how much time went by until we restarted the project in 2010. Everything was changed, but the strategy was actually so strong that we could just adju adjust it with single, you know, with simple movements uh, and still have the same strong um, entity. So here we have the straight paths that uh, can of course be straight um, in plan, but that can have topography in all sorts of directions um, in the vertical uh, sphere. 
paths that are not only paths, but that are also places to meet and places to create activities like markets or fashion shows, and paths that are also telling stories about the park. So our intention is to, to tell stories while you're walking. Um, the name of our project was Library of Trees, Biblioteca degli Alberi. And the idea was that it's a space, a public space like a library, and at the same time also a place where you can learn uh, in the city and where you can meet and where you can do public activities. So our paths will tell the stories about the trees that we are planting in this park. At the same time, you can just walk there, you can have leisure. We created certain pavilions that really are intertwined with the program of the park. And then, of course, there are the fields, uh, these irregular fields that are all separate gardens that are uh, a multitude of different planting, but also pavement, simple lawns or meadows, but also very intricate uh, planted fields um, where the planting was designed by Pete Audolf um, in the competition phase already. We worked with Pete Audolf on the planting, and he's still part of the team. Uh, the other layer, the last layer, is the circular forest, where we plant one species of tree in per circle, one age, which is very monofunctional or monocultural, you could say. It's very bad biology. But in the end, it's probably one of the most biodiverse parks in Milan because we have 23 different species in this park. So in effect, it's not always what it looks like. And uh, these volumes are architectural volumes that really collect and gather all the program that you will have in a park. So the playgrounds are designed together with these volumes of trees. And that enables us to create a real contrast between open and closed. So the open fields, they are really open. So they are not cluttered with all sorts of elements. And in the, in the volumes of the trees, you will have all the all the program like um, swings or simple sitting places or outdoor gyms, etc. There's a lot of artistic places which we didn't have to design, which just are there already as a sort of present. There are also very simple um, circles where you can just be, so not everything has to be programmed in a park. But then at the same time, it can be used in many different ways. So one day it can be open <coughs> and empty and the next day it can be very crowded. And this was our ambition. <laughs> that's why we say we wish. Um, because that was something we struggled for, and that's also something we, we still struggle with, that um, so many things have to be regulated in a park, and that we actually would love to make it a bit more free. So the park is starting to take shape at this moment. Uh, this is an older picture. This is a picture from a few weeks ago. And two weeks ago, we opened the first part of the park, which is what you see here. It's a tiny piece of the 10 hectare, uh, but still it's a starting point. It's with the first straight paths, it's with the first circles of trees. And as we speak now, the, the main side works for the rest of the pass, uh, park are taking shape. So hopefully everything will be finished by the end of this year, beginning next year. So you can see the first uh, circles of trees. And um, this is a, a fence because uh, the first part of the park was actually a garden surrounding an, um, a fondazione, uh, public building where, where you have exhibitions, etc. So it's a private part within a public part. Uh, but we try to design the fence in a way that it's not a strict border, but that it has some, um, yeah, like a curtain almost. <coughs> um, takes a shape that also ignores uh, straight boundaries. And it doesn't only do it in plan, but also in section. So we created actually uh, seats in this, um, in this uh, fence, which can be used from both sides. So you can use them from the public part, but also from the, from <coughs> the interior. And it was very nice to see when the garden was opened a few weeks ago, like the fences were opened and the people streamed in and took possession of their, their garden. And as I heard, it's been, ever, it's been like that ever since. So uh, in this little part, there are kitchen gardens. By the way, is the sound okay? I hear a bit of a metallic sound, it's okay? 
Um, so there are kitchen gardens, there are pergolas, where in the future, of course, you see how bare and empty they are. Um, where in the future you can sit in the shade uh, on a restaurant terrace. Uh, these empty boxes here, they will be filled uh, by the restaurant owner in this building because he will make his kitchen garden in here. There are water features. So the garden is already a sort of promise of the future park. Another kind of uh, trajectory is that um, of the past that is more a sort of um, suggestion, not a prescription. If we pass, uh, that lures and inspires. Uh, this project is the, the campus of the university in Amsterdam, the UFA. It's in the middle of the city, and it used to be an isolated part in the city surrounded by a fence until uh, the, the University of Amsterdam decided to really open the, the, the fence and the boundaries and make it a public area and really allow also the city to enter this site. And um, a an British architect, AHMM, uh, Simon Alford from London, he um, did a wonderful um, renovation of the old buildings which were from the 70s and he really made a masterpiece of renovation in my mind. Uh, so all the buildings are not only more beautiful, but they are also much more efficient. So from 3,000 students, this area will go to 10,000 students. So it will be many more students at one t at, on one hand, but on the other hand also the whole public uh, of, the of, the, of the surrounding of this area. So that, that will also give an enormous pressure on this area. And that was actually the challenge of this uh, project. Uh, we started with uh, asking ourselves, like, um, how, how should it look like? Because it's a very international university with many international students. They come to Amsterdam because they want to study in Amsterdam. They should feel in Amsterdam. So we decided that uh, we would continue the simple base of the uh, Amsterdam center, the canals, because we are in the canal area. Uh, so we just didn't choose our own materials, we just went along with what the city has, uh, the bases, so the red brick, uh, the blue limestones, uh, sort of um, lantern, and the elm trees that are everywhere in Amsterdam. And on top of these bases, we added a ribbon, a sort of signature for the university, that um, on one hand is a signature to define the campus within the, the bigger frame of the city, but on the other hand, could also be read as a sort of path or trajectory that students are taking during studies. You know, you think you go from A to B, but actually you do all these kind of loops that enrich your life and that uh, create a sort of uh, sense of um, growth also. Um, so this ribbon was actually made within the brick with the same kind of materials, but then white bricks. And uh, this ribbon is a thing that sometimes comes up and becomes a bench. And sometimes it also creates places within the bigger whole. So green places, it, it defines places. And uh, in a courtyard, it goes really crazy. It creates a sort of uh, knot where you can keep on looking at, meditating maybe. But you can also go out and follow the path meditating. And, uh, take a rest in this courtyard. And this is how it looked after construction, and this is how it looked a bit later. And another aspect that we try to use in each project is, of course, also using certain chances that you have with planting. In this project, it was that there were certain courtyards which create a microclimate in themselves that allow us also to plant uh, plants that are a bit more delicate, uh, like the magnolia trees. So we have several different species of magnolia trees which would probably not prosper so well in other places in Amsterdam, but in these courtyards it's a, it's a good chance. And we used white planting to continue the ribbon wherever it would cross a planting field. And also this project is still under construction, uh, ongoing, you see some places, but while it, this is being built next door, in, um, the construction is just starting. So you see the, the bench that follows the ribbon that we designed for this uh, project. And um, 
several other areas with benches, etc. And it's almost finished. This is the last piece that has to be finished. It's a bridge uh, over one of the canals that will connect both parts of the campus and that at the same time will also be a sort of meeting point. We called it a flirting bridge because we have benches on both sides of the bridge so that you can sit there comfortably looking at the people passing by or sitting opposite. So it will be also a sort of central um, element in the campus. The next trajectory um, or the next project uh, uses the traject or uses water as the trajectory. Um, it is in Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, our assignment was to uh, think about how we can revive the American downtown, which is like a huge problem. I'm sure you came across it in your own work. Um, so the, the centers of many downtown areas. Um, are very empty and um, meaningless and full of cars and empty park car parks. Um, when we started with this project, we were amazed, like, first, I, I should first show you how it looks like. This is how it looks like. So many big roads, big empty car parks, no people on the street. That's also what you see in the pictures here. And then here in the bottom, you see a creek at the end coming out from underneath. And we were totally surprised when we saw this map to realize that we're in this wonderful river landscape of Kentucky. So our assignment was actually to come up with a strategy how to revive this downtown area. And this is the situation there. There is a motorway going right through the city center where we really discussed uh, the plans with, our, with the municipality also to reroute the traffic, not to go to the center anymore, to allow uh, bicycling, and to also allow nature back into the city, because why all these empty car parks? You know, you can bring, bring back nature in all these uh, uh, empty areas, and maybe with nature, life will also come back to the city. Uh, but we didn't think only of nature coming back to the city, we thought, that everything should be intertwined and linked. So traffic should profit from it, culture should profit, um, history should um, get a notion in the city. So we came back again, looking a bit closer to the map and discovering that Lexington was actually built on the town branch creek of the Colorado River. Um, and um, that was very exciting to us because you couldn't see it, but you would know because Lexington is famous for its bourbon, and bourbon needs fresh uh, water. So actually the Town Branch Creek was the starting point of the city, but somehow at a certain point they decided to bury it underneath the city. So it was um, put into culverts underneath the city and no one ever knew about it anymore. Um, so we came up with a plan uh, to actually daylight this creek again and use the creek as a meaning to get life back into the city and to create a connective trajectory to, uh, to the city. A bit like the high line, you could say, a low line then. Uh, of course, also with this idea, we, we had to think about water management because the creek is a bit um, erratic. Uh, sometimes there is too little water, and then at other times there is too much water. So we would have to provide for the times with no water, because otherwise you just have this canyon somewhere in your city, or a dry river. And at other times you would also have to see that all the water can really you know, run off or infiltrate. So we came up with a very intricate and technical system of how to use the culverts, uh, so these underground um, pipes, to recycle <coughs> rainwater from buildings, from air conditioning, etc., into the into the creek. And here you see a, a sort of standard section of how it is now with the culverts underneath and how they would be used to actually recycle the water in the creek. And that's the effect that we were hoping to get in the, in the city center. So you see the sections from the current situation to a new situation. And you could do it with a very wide section, but also with quite narrow sections. 
because all those sections were totally oversized, totally insane in a way. And uh, this was our dream for Lexington. Um, they are making a start with that. Uh, after our first vision, they made a competition, which was won by Kate Orff, and she's creating a little, tiny little fountain. We wish it would have been a bit more a grand gesture, and maybe a slower process to really reach uh, daylighting the creek again. But we hope maybe in the future that they will decide for that. So there's all these different spaces that could really be activated uh, by the creek and that could profit from this, uh, from this water. We became quite technical freaks in water management, I have to admit. We do that sometimes. So of course you have to do a lot of things for that, reduce downtown car traffic, um, cost off some roads, but you see there's so many roads and a grid system is also very flexible and you know, enlarging uh, the distance. Of course you would have to provide alternatives with uh, public transport and biking, but you would also get city life back and hopefully people. Uh, for the planting, we were actually inspired by the, again, by the native vegetation. Um, and what we discovered is also something that uh, the people there didn't actually notice, or didn't think it was odd. But for us, it was so amazing to see how many different oaks they have. You know, in, in you know, Central and North Europe, we have a limited amount uh, that we can use. But there they have all these different varieties where you could almost not tell that it's all one oak or all part of one family. So um, we use that. We use different kinds of grasses that grow in different environments. But of course, because it's a city, we also introduce ornamental planting um, that can be native, but can also be exotic. And so we hope to bring life back into the city and get people moving again. And this was an image from a huge car park before, as you see it here with the creek coming out for one moment and the rendering. Is it still okay to keep on talking? Um, then I will take you to another place, uh, to Israel. Um, we are currently also there, we are also uh, currently constructing. Um, we are working on I the Hebrew house in Rishon Lezion. Rishon Lezion is the third biggest city in Israel, and it's also the place where they started using Hebrew in daily life. Uh, as you might know, uh, before Hebrew was only used in um, rituals to read uh, the Torah, uh, but it was never used to really communicate on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and in this place, actually, a teacher just uh, came to this idea to say, you know, we are coming from all over the world, we speak different languages, let's speak Hebrew together. And uh, he started doing that in a school, and this school uh, will become the Hebrew Center, or the ha Center for Hebrew Language, Beit Livrit, uh, where they will celebrate, investigate, communicate the Hebrew language. Um, the site uh, was a very diverse site in a, in a residential but central neighborhood in Rishon Lezion. Uh, it consisted of the old school where the, uh, where the famous moment happened that uh, uh, it was taught to kids as daily uh, language. Uh, it will have a new building designed by Efrat Kowalski architects from Tel Aviv, the House of Hebrew, and it will have a new building for this old school um, all together on one plot. And so these buildings are separated from each other, but the idea is that this whole campus actually works as one unit. When we came there, we looked at the site, we looked, we walked around it, we looked at it from the neighbor's buildings, and what we saw was all these dilapidated, strange fences, walls, etc. And it looked very much unconnected somehow. Fences are a big thing in uh, Tel Aviv, as you can, or in Israel, as you can imagine. And what we liked is that the kids could just run around, like that there was a lot of space that they could just run around. That's something we wanted to keep. And we looked at one of the old pictures of the school, and what struck us was how everyone gathers under these trees. You know, we would go out in the open on the stair and take the picture, 
but here they take the picture under the trees. So that's the situation in Israel, again, all about microclimate. And we thought that's actually something we should really work with. Of course, also water management, etc., using water to cool. But the main thing was that we thought this fence, which we had to surround uh, the whole site with, it had to be a, a very solid fence, according to Israeli uh, safety regulations, two meters high, steel, certain amount of uh, distance, had to be there. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to integrate it into an element that, you know, not hides the, the fence, but integrates it. And that makes it more than just a fence. And that also unifies this whole campus uh, as, one, as one campus, you know, makes it a campus. So just before we really started designing on this project, we all went on a field trip together. And by chance, we came across this um, this uh, beautiful element in a, in a landscape park. And that is actually our inspiration for this whole uh, project, to integrate the fence into a berceau, that's how the French call it, uh, in green element, you could also call it a pergola, uh, that on one hand provides shelter for people on the inside, and on the other side also creates a green identity or a sort of visible identity for this area. And then we thought that uh, it would also be nice if the, the surrounding could profit from it, because it's an edge, you know, why just only think about shelter on the inside, could also have a nice relationship with the outside. So when people are waiting for their kids to come from school, they can wait in the shade. So we created this uh, series of different uh, sections, which uh, create outdoor classrooms, but also barriers to rather ugly neighbors' buildings and also create privacy for the neighbors and also open relationships, so all these different conditions in one. And then at the same time, it could be used by uh, the Hebrew house but also by the school for many different purposes. And we are currently detailing it in a way so that you can also create a constant trajectory <coughs> in the shade all around the site, but at the same time, it's also a place that you can use for all kinds of program. Uh, again, we worked very closely together with the architects to, um, to also create a dis uh, uh, connection between inside and outside. And in this case, you can hardly call it inside and outside because the climate is actually so good. If you provide shade and UV protection, you are fine. So actually, you can forget about walls uh, as long as you have shade. So the ground floor of this building be designed in a way that the facade can open up to create uh, shade, but uh, also create an open um, connection to the garden. So like this um, example from Lina Bobadi, uh, you would be able to have uh, openings, exhibitions, uh, language fairs, markets, etc., on the site that would fluidly go inside and outside. with one surface that connects inside and outside, so the bricks are continuing inside and outside. Yes. Then uh, another trajectory in, um, in architecture. Uh, this is another collaboration with OM8, it's more recent. Uh, it's a theater building in Taipei. Uh, which is a multi-stage um, theater that, you know, with, with uh, tribunes that are clicked together in a way that they can connect to each other. And what is very interesting about this place is that it used to be, the site used to be the place where they held the night market. And I don't know if you know Taipei, but that's the thing in Taipei, the night market. Looks like this. It's very greasy, it's very colorful, noisy, smelly. Uh, you can eat stinky tofu and uh, other stuff. And it's also a place where, where everyone meets before they go to a, th a theater performance or to the cinema or to go out dancing. So it's really also a sort of meeting place for culture. And we thought it would be really great if you could combine this high culture element of uh, theater with the low culture of the night market. So together with the architects, we actually managed uh, to raise the building and put it on pilotis, 
so that the square could be kept uh, for a possible open or for a possible um, use as a night market. So this whole square is actually a very sturdy concrete square. <coughs> it's really as a market square has to be in Taipei, really that you can easily clean it from all the grease and fat and uh, whatever. Um, and it continues just underneath the building and the building is sits above. Um, so we imagine that all these activities take place that they have there. And at the same time, we also like the idea that it would be great if everyone could enter the roof because or see the building, like if you could visit the building and be a sneaky peek part of uh, the performances and what's happening and maybe also the, the um, rehearsals in the, in the theater. So together with OMA, we designed a route through the building that takes you passing by rehearsal rooms or gives you a sneaky peek into the, into the main hall, as you see here, and ends up on the roof terrace, where you really have a beautiful view. And this roof terrace is absolutely public. So this uh, trajectory is isolated within the, uh, the entirety of the, um, of the theater so that you can actually be part of it, because otherwise it wouldn't be possible. And um, we also connected uh, the, like the landscape on the ground floor with the roof terraces in language um, because we actually wanted so as much as possible usable space on the ground floor. We actually pushed aside the green and made it in very strong uh, sort of podia on the sides uh, where actually the trees are placed on a raised platform and could act as actors because trees in Taipei are very special. They are all crooked somehow and they have very special shapes. Oh, you don't see that in that model. But they are very crooked and bended and they are very characteristic types somehow. And we actually designed this planting in a way that you have the straight guys and you have the crooked guys and you could make up your own storyline of this uh, performance. Um, of course, uh, the model to explain it all. And then the building works going on again. Also, this project is currently under construction. And will look like this in a short while, hopefully. Um, this is another one of the projects in Qatar. Are you still OK, or is it taking too long? I can skip it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. The, the water recipe garden that I showed in the introduction is here. Uh, and this is the National Library of Qatar within the education city. So this big uh, plain of sand on this uh, aerial image will eventually become the education city. It already looks a bit more filled up, I have to say. Um, and um, OMA designed the National Library as well as the headquarters of Qatar Foundation, the other project. And uh, it was designed in a way that it's really a sort of sculptural entity, like uh, it creates these um, shaded outdoor rooms in front of the entrances. And um, we have to say, maybe let's start with this image. This is what you see when you go to Qatar. And we were, to be honest, quite shocked about it, especially when we heard that I think 14,000 liters of water go into uh, a palm tree per day. So it's, it's in huge amounts. Uh, I'm not very good with numbers, but it was something impressive like this. Uh, the same for the lawn. Uh, and I have to tell you that the planting comes from Amsterdam. And we were totally shocked by that. And we thought, like, that's not what we want. We want something different. So for the one project, we worked with the native plant. And for the National Library, we actually looked at, you know, what's the landscape? So that's the landscape. It's sand. It's pavement, you know. And then once in a while, a natural miracle coming out of the sand. This is a parasite uh, that actually comes out of the hot desert sand and somewhere like meters and meters underground, it connects to another plant, to the roots of another plant. It's a miracle. But this is how plants look like in Qatar. So you have sand and these accents of planting. And it reminded us also a bit of uh, Lanzarote, uh, where they created vineyards in a very, um, yeah, hostile environment, let's say, uh, a very 
uh, dry environment where they also had to capture like all the uh, humidity that you can get uh, to kept, keep the plants alive and at the same time also shelter them from wind conditions. So we thought that's actually what we want to do because we have sandstorms in Qatar that can be quite harmful to planting. Uh, at the same time, you have very limited precipitation. Um, so we created this landform uh, of dishes. We called it indentation. I'm not sure if that's the right word in English. Um, which we would fill with beautiful individual plants. Uh, we laid out a system of, um, um, of indentations that go from small and shallow to deep and wide so that you would also have different scales. And of course you could plant more trees in it, but you could also just have one tree in a big hole. That would also be very exciting. Uh, of course these indentations could eventually become little oases uh, surrounding the library, places where you can study and read if the weather allows it. And that's the layout that we designed around this building because it's quite a sculptural building. You know, you don't want to go around with all sort of uh, curvy landscape forms. Um, so we made it quite systematic. And uh, in between you can actually take your own trajectory. So the trajectory is the space in between. And you can go in between these planters and see all these different species. The species that we selected were from two families. We have something with families, you might notice. Um, and in this case we chose two families, uh, the acacias <coughs> and the agaves. And those uh, families, they don't need any water. They are xerophytic plants. And that's actually something that we wanted to try out. We wanted to make a garden where you don't need any water. Hopefully. But I think it works already. Uh, of course, you take the acacia and you know it. And you know it might know it like this, but it also looks like this. It has very many different uh, ways of flowering in little balls or different shapes. It has silvery leaves, uh, narrow or round. It ha some of the species can have very beautiful bark and a very fine uh, silhouette. And the same with the um, agave. They can be huge, uh, above men height. It can have very delicate details uh, or beautiful silhouettes. It can almost look like a grass field or like snakes or octopus. So within one family, you actually have a lot of richness. And then you have the flowering um, stems of the agave, which are also almost like different kind of trees, like, like this. And that's what we did. And then we planted them, and it looks very bad. But um, slowly, you know, of, of course, planting takes time, especially if you don't throw lots of water on it. Uh, they are establishing. So you can see the first, uh, um, well, you get the idea. And the first birds have arrived, which is always a good sign. And this is how it will look like in the future. I think this is the one before the last uh, project. It's um, not a landscape project. It's more a sort of exhibition uh, project. We were asked by La Casa Encedida in Madrid to do an installation, an exhibition, or something. It wasn't very defined. And um, while we were thinking about what, what to talk about or what to research, we started talking to people who said, um, yeah, who were concerned about nature, who said there's not enough green, there's not about enough uh, nature in Madrid. So we looked into it, and we found out that there actually is a lot of nature, that there is actually Madrid is a bird place. It's on the migration route uh, from north of Europe to Africa. So at least twice a year they have a lot of birds and they should really also take care of their birds. And that's actually something that we wanted to bring into mind. So uh, we did some visual interventions in this building, which were quite simple, uh, like the sunscreens that we, they were, I think, orange when we came and we just made them into something else. Uh, with silhouettes of birds that when you are inside create a sort of interaction with the bird. So in the course of the <coughs> day, when it's sunny, the bird would fly around your room. Owls. 
And at the same time, we also created a trajectory, a literal trajectory through the whole building. This is a model of a carpet uh, that we made, a carpet that actually symbolizes all the different landscape types that you find around Madrid and the birds that are related to it. So the carpet would actually fold all around the building and lead people in and up and through the building. And it was used for educational purpose to talk about um, this issue, of course. And in, on this map here on the wall <coughs> was a sort of interactive map that people could also tell about their stories, about their uh, experiences with nature, like define their favorite spots where you can bird watch or where you can find certain kinds of eagles or owls or whatever. So it was also something for the people to take part in. That's a bit hard to follow. <laughs> and we ended up on the roof where we created a little um, um, a little space where people could interact with each other. At the end of this uh, exhibition, all the material was recycled by the uh, institution. So they took our sunscreens and they took our carpets and they made it into, I don't know what, into bags and I think slippers and whatever. So it became a very creative uh, thing. So lots of birds in all the households in Madrid now. And the last project is a very old project. Um, it's called Rifle Tutti. Um, I almost always show it because I think it's, it's so nice and so charming. I wasn't actually involved in it, but I still love it. Uh, it's, uh, it's during the, the Biennale for Art uh, in Venice, a uh, long time ago, I can't remember when. Oh, I was probably on the first slide. Uh, and this is the plan of Villa Manin. And Petra was invited to um, to design a pavilion in this garden, a temporary pavilion only for this art um, expo. And temporary pavilions is something that we're a bit uh, hesitant uh, about. Uh, like, yeah, you, know, you build something and you take it apart in a few weeks after. Um, so actually, Inside Outside decided to create personal pavilions, you know, for people to carry around. And they were made in our studio with lots of uh, handicraft. Um, that's another story. And these, um, these umbrellas or these personal pavilions, they were partially see-through, so you could see the garden in front of you or what is behind you. And people could take it in their hands and you know, follow their own trajectory to the park, actually. They would protect them also. like the people from the sun, of course. And throughout this park, um, there were several moments where you could really interact with the place, you know, go really deep uh, in the reflection. So those were the moments uh, you could relate to. And this is the end of it. We would very much welcome questions. Thank you so much. Um, just to explain, the microphone doesn't project your voice at all, but it is there for the film, because we want to share this online so people around the world can see Jana's fantastic lecture. But otherwise, you'll have uh, no question. It'll just be like an empty silence, and then <laughs> Jana answering. So please wait for the mic. Myself and Edwin will run around to wherever you are to ask a question, but please speak into it. But don't expect anything to happen when you speak. <laughs> We have a, a particular issue in this country with diminishing funding for maintaining our public landscapes, particularly parks, um, some fairly severe reductions. And I just wondered, as you work across the globe, if you come across that as an issue, um, and to what extent you get involved in sort of management plans or how the maintenance ongoing shapes your designs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very hot item for us. It's really like, it keeps us busy all the time. Like, 
some projects that we have finished long time ago, they are for us still ongoing because we still haven't managed to get the maintenance going in the way that we want. Because the issue is not only here, it's, it's really everywhere. It's also in Holland, there is a really low, you know, um, feeling for maintenance sometimes, you know, it's not always. Um, and it's a problem. You know, we, we, we see it now, for example, in Rutes Island, uh, in the project in Amsterdam. I'm going there almost every month to talk with the maintenance people to convince them to get active, you know, to do something, uh, mm. to organize it in a certain way. And it's very tough. So sometimes it doesn't succeed and sometimes it does. For example, in Milan, people actually um, think with us together we were approached during the process uh, by um, communities in uh, Milan uh, from the areas around who were interested and wanted to get involved in the plan and into the park. And we actually took some time to really talk to them. We presented the ideas, we heard what their comments were, etc. And uh, together with them, we are still uh, trying to get maintenance to a higher level because also there we only have the basic ma maintenance. But as you can imagine, this plan in Milan, it needs higher maintenance, it needs special maintenance. And uh, this is also something that we share experience with, with uh, Pete Audolf. Um, I'm not sure if you are aware of how uh, the gardens are maintained, for example, in New York and in Chicago. Uh, there is a whole community organizations involved in it, like uh, people from the neighborhood, they volunteer to you know, help with the maintenance. They get organized by people who are professionals and they, you know, they get their, their coat or their badge or their, you know, hat, and they, they help, they do maintenance, and they get instructed because they like to do gardening, they like to be instructed by someone, you know, like Pete Audolf, who really knows about planting, and they like to be part of uh, this park in their neighborhood. So this is something we are trying to learn from now, also from Milan, because we have this uh, group of local residents who are really willing to do that, they all say, we want to do it, we want to help. And of course, it can also be almost a danger, you know, because if they just go out and do something, they might not really do the right thing. So we have to see how we can organize it and how we can also not make it uh, too formal, you know, that you put them in a sort of straitjacket. We don't want that. But it is something that we are very much busy with. On the other hand, we, funny enough, have a project at hand at the moment. It's a holiday park where there's too much maintenance going on. You won't believe it. And uh, we really think hard about how we can turn it around, like how we can teach those gardeners who are maintaining this holiday park to become natural keepers, you know, keepers of nature rather than maintainers. So they only cut grass and they only clip trees and they clip hedges, but they should be, you know, looking at the welfare of plants so there, in this group, we really want to design or actually uh, realize the design through the maintenance. So I hope that we can also find a way to really communicate to these people who are the gardeners, who are doing what they've been doing, what they've told to be, do, to be doing like for, for decades maybe, uh, but also teach them different ways and how they can reach a different result. Yeah. So I don't have to answer, but we are trying. <laughs> um, it seems obvious that humor runs right the way through your work. Is that something that's conscious, uh, a conscious decision in your practice or in the office? Is it something that, that you humor, think about? Honey. It feels like it, yeah. There's a joyful humor that's in all nice. the work. That's a good compliment. I'm happy. No, it's totally not conscious, absolutely not. That would be really ridiculous, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, I don't, even, I don't even see it, I have to say. Maybe that's humorless of me. But, you know, we just have joy in the things. You know, it's, it's always that you, um, you, you do something you like, and <coughs> of course you want to do it differently, so you try a twist, you do something surprising. Um, no, I don't think it's a conscious thing. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Apart from fabulous things, I'm also seeing uh, collaboration uh, in what you've been doing. You, yeah. you, you must be working with a lot of uh, other practitioners uh, of some different professions that in, in order to achieve that. But the, the question I was going to, to ask is um, you've got some fantastic clients too. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I wonder what's your secret? <laughs> 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 mm, I, I don't know. We don't we don't have it. You know, I think from from what you do, you also attract a certain kind of uh, client. So I think if you're just true to yourself, I, I mean, I can't really answer that from from my side. But I think what I've seen Petra doing is she just always did what she believed in. You know, like. Uh, uh, she was hired for interiors, but she gave her comments on landscape, and clients were listening to it, you know, because it made sense, you know, one has to do with the other. When you stand uh, in front of a window with a beautiful curtain, and you look out and you see, what? You know, you have to put it together somehow. And I think it just grows in a way, but now um, we also actively search sometimes, but that's never bringing anything. It's mainly that people find us, I think. That somehow t to just do what you believe in and also speak out for what you think, that, that <coughs> you attract certain people. Because I think in before I started working with Petra at Inside Outside, I was working as a landscape architect and I never felt entitled you know, to say my opinion about the facade, oh my God. But this is what we do, like we do that. You know, people don't always listen to us, no, but you get into a conversation and then you also understand why it is like this and you can react to it or maybe they listen and maybe they open up something or maybe we are able to open up a parking garage and let the light in. So there's, you know, you can do stuff by just speaking your mind, I guess. Yeah. It's close by, sorry. I really enjoyed your lecture. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, um, do your designs generally emerge from a quite a gradual, um, methodical process that's maybe quite iterative and you, you revisit earlier uh, parts of your design process? Or are there more sudden moments of inspiration suddenly? an idea maybe emerges from nowhere. Um. Yeah, there is no one strategy. There is no, not one system that we are following or something. Sometimes we like, um, it happens sometimes that we went to a site and that we thought like, this is it, you know, this has to happen here. Like in Qatar a bit, you know, that you go around and listen to people telling where the plants are coming from, you know, and you know that you cannot do that. and that you have to work with something else. But then design-wise, I think um, it depends also a bit if the, like for example, in the Qatar projects, the content was quite complex. Like what we are trying to achieve is the planting there is quite complex and uh, it has a sort of systematic um, uh, layeredness uh, somehow. So we also wanted to keep the design simple. And also because the buildings, you know, really were so sculptural and needed attention that you have to keep it simple. So you choose a very systematic approach of how you lay out, you know, this layout, for example. But then at other times it can be very intuitive, you know, like you, um, you sketch, you doodle a bit, you know, and then suddenly you have a wooded island, <laughs> uh, like the campus <coughs> in Amsterdam. Um, I, c I couldn't say how we do it, you know, it's, it's a process. But sometimes, indeed, we go through, we always make different options. And sometimes it might happen that we throw one apart and then we continue with something else and then we look over our shoulder and think like, hey, there it is. So that's, that's also possible. Yeah. question uh, for the university students we've got here who are starting out on their career in landscape architecture and perhaps other subjects I mean what would as a experienced practitioner what would be your your advice to them a general advice yeah just a general <laughs> advice uh, just oof, just enjoy what you're doing mm -hmm. you know I think that's that's really the core of it but I think all the landscape architects do that right uh, I think there's no one there who was told by his mama to become a landscape architect. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think all of us, we have a sort of passion and things are coming together. 
And I think maybe the advice I just sort of gave, like like that you just follow your 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 passion and that you also speak your mind freely. I think that's important. Like I think sometimes uh, landscape architects are too modest. You know, they they you know they were trained to you know design gardens or landscapes or whatever. But it's a very complex um, um, profession. You know so many different things, and you can speak about <coughs> other subjects too. I think people should be more uh, also encouraged to think out of their own practice, actually. Like also think with the architects, criticize architecture. Why not? Or you know, make it artworks, what you're doing. So that you're really like also trespassing the boundaries. Of course, that was what this whole lecture series was about. But I think that's probably the, the advice I want to give because uh, I could also say like earn a lot of money, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean you will probably do not achieve that in landscape architecture. Then you really have to choose another profession. <laughs> we are more hobbyists. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start with one. But thanks, thank you for uh, the lecture. Uh, I enjoy. Uh, listening to your process work and how you actually explain the, the story and that process through excellent diagrams, very simplistic, and I think hopefully the students can learn from that. The two students who I wanted to learn just, just walked out, but um, uh, <laughs> because it's that explaining in simple, with simple design and, and very powerful design, uh, the simple reasoning and those diagrams that I think mm. really just are spot on Thank and uh, excellent. Um, I think the curtain, I, I, I've read about you and, um, and the work and seen the work, but the curtain aspect um, and how it divides inside and out is, is quite a new view that you've explained for me today. But who came first? Was it you met the curtain maker and that developed that concept or did the curtain maker come to you? I mean, it's strange to have a curtain maker in a practice <laughs> no, and uh, with yeah. architects and landscape architects and uh, it's, uh, it's quite a strong concept for you. So I just yeah. wondered, in this collaboration, okay. which came first. Yeah. Okay, now I really have to speak for Petra, mm -hmm. because that's really not my field of work. But uh, it's really Petra who made that. Mm -hmm. uh, she is an artist. Uh, she started uh, out making exhibitions uh, at the Stalic Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, from there, so she started making exhibitions for architects, for OMA. Uh, she started, you know, from those exhibitions to talk with them about interiors. And then uh, um, it, I think it was at the Dance Theatre in The Hague, uh, the project of OMA in Heim Colas, um, which unfortunately last year was demolished. Um, and they were working as a team on the interiors. And at a certain point, they said, like, okay, we need a stage curtain. And Peter said, I can do it. You know, that's mm -hmm. what I was talking about, you know, say, I can do it. And she did the stage curtain. It was a beautiful uh, curtain, which you should look up on our website. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very beautiful. It's almost, it's called liquid gold in our project. It's circles of uh, golden dots uh, printed on velvet. And when the curtain moves, it's really like liquid gold. And, you know, she just did it. She's not a curtain maker. Mm -hmm. She just did it. And I think every one of us can do what you want to do. Uh, you just have to have the courage to do it, and of course also the eye and you know someone who allows you to do it. But I think in the end you don't need a curtain maker. Maybe it shouldn't be a curtain maker who innovates, mm -hmm. because what came after that is actually quite an innovation, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Petra and Inside Outside uh, is, is um, really pioneer in making the curtain autonomous, because it's really not just the curtain dividing inside and outside but it's really creating spaces within architecture. So autonomous spaces within spaces. So for example, there are several projects where auditoriums are divided by curtains or where spaces are created. There's one nice project also in uh, London, uh, the Rothschild Bank by OMA, where in the streetscape, actually you can see there's a lobby, uh, where there's also a sort of wall with um, uh, elements on it which also divides uh, spaces and I think a curtain maker I think he couldn't come up with that because he's mm -hmm. thought how to do a curtain but he's not thought how to free a curtain or to how to make it autonomous mm -hmm. 
I think you always have to have a different angle on this kind of things. Can I, can I just ask about the circle? <coughs> Yes. Um, it's uh, a theme that runs, th I think it creates, as an art and style, it creates a simplicity mm -hmm. to say what you want to say. Yes. So I just wondered what a circle meant we to get yourself. It a lot. Yeah, we get I've asked them all before, lot. I've asked different people what it means to them and the yeah. It, yeah, yeah. what it means to you. Yeah, I have to say I really discovered it in my work with uh, Petra also because uh, indeed uh, sometimes what we want to do is so complex that you have to simplify it or uh, sometimes architecture is so rigid that you want to put the ultimate, you know, reverse to it, you know, something that's round and not straight. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just a good shape. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> now you can do so many things with it, you know, you can fill it with, with all sorts of different stuff to make a bunch, but you can also very systematically use it as modules. And um, of course we work in certain urban environments where <coughs> you also have a sort of artificial language. Of course I'm not sure if you would do it uh, in a real landscape project. You would probably also do use different tools, or maybe not. I just like to thank you very much on behalf of everyone here, Jana, for a fantastic talk. Yeah, it's been really, really interesting and yeah, intriguing to see the inside story of inside outside your inside out. <laughs> thank, thank you. you all very thank much. you for listening. Thank you.